Hello, I'm Professor George F. Rice, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to import a virtual machine appliance onto your Linux, Windows, or Macintosh computer for use in your class this semester. Now, unless your professor tells you otherwise, you're not required to use this appliance. But it's almost certainly the least difficult way to get all the tools that you need onto your machine configured properly and ready to go. Now, in order to do this, you're going to need to take five steps. You'll need to install VirtualBox. You'll need to download or otherwise acquire the virtual machine appliance file. You'll need to import that file into VirtualBox, configure and launch your virtual machine, and then ensure that any data you store on the virtual machine is backed up religiously to ensure you don't lose data in event of a disaster. Now, I'm going to walk you through all five of those steps. So let's get started. VirtualBox is like a software PC that is running on top of your physical PC. It could be a Windows machine, a Mac machine, a Linux machine, laptop, desktop, doesn't really matter. This VirtualBox will run any operating system that you want to set up. But today we're mostly interested in setting up an appliance, an operating system that has been pre-configured with most of the tools that you'll need to do your work this semester. How do you get VirtualBox onto your physical machine? Well, you go to virtualbox.org and click the giant Download VirtualBox button right in the middle of that web page. Whatever version is there is the version that you want. We'll be perfectly happy with that. You install VirtualBox just like you would any other application on your host computer. Next, you're going to need the appliance file. Now, in order to get that, you can ask your professor. They'll give you the one they want you to use. Or you can come to uh, github.com slash prof-rice slash csc-vm for the default. If you slide down just a little bit, you will see that a release is available for download. Now, this is not a small file. In this case, four gigabytes. Not something you want to download with, through your cell phone network. So use the university. Um, network to download this file or use a thumb drive and just get it directly from your professor. If you do a download, it's important to verify that the download got every byte correct. Otherwise, your virtual machine will crash in strange and wondrous ways. So we use an MD5 checksum, which is provided for you here, which your professor will provide for you if they provide the link to you. How do you check that the file that you downloaded is in, in fact correct? Well, you, if you're on Windows, you'll use CertUtil. On Mac, you'll use MD5. On Linux, MD5 sum. Here's the commands that you need. You will run those commands. Here's the Windows version. And here is the checksum that was calculated. I usually check about five digits. 10, 8, A, E. Check over here for the download. 10, A, 8, E. Looks like that download was correct. So we have our appliance, we've downloaded it, or we have copied it from the flash drive. Now it is time to go install it into VirtualBox. The first time you launch VirtualBox, you will see this interface. To import the appliance, you can click the Import button, or you can go to File, Import, Appliance. From the local file system, you click this little yellow button over here with an arrow, and go find the file that you downloaded. It should be a .ova file. That is the file, meaning you've got a virtual machine there. So when we open that, we will click Next. And we have to make a couple of changes before we begin the import. One is RAM. If you have 4 gigabytes or more, I'd give your virtual machine 2 gigabytes. If you have less than 4 gigabytes, I would give the virtual machine half of the memory that you want to use. Okay. Given that, then the other thing that we need to check is MAC address policy. Um, we want to change this to generate a new MAC address for all network adapters. What that is doing is giving a new physical uh, network name for these devices so that they do not argue with the physical name that, and cause some problems on the network. So generate new MAC addresses for all network adapters. Otherwise, you should be pretty good. Just go with the defaults and we'll click Import. The importing will take a little while and we'll be back in a moment. Five minutes on my ancient laptop which is running Windows rather poorly nowadays. So it's done and we see that our um, CSE VM 3.0 or whatever your version is has now been installed. 
Now, before we power it up, I know you're anxious to get to booting, let's talk about a couple of issues. The disk inside the virtual machine cannot be accessed from your host computer. That's a problem because if you put your homework on the disk inside the virtual machine and the disk dies, which does happen in a virtual box sometimes, you lose your homework. Don't let VirtualBox eat your homework. Take precautions. You have at least three options. One is we can go into settings before we launch and come down to shared folders. What we're going to do here is to share a folder on the host machine with the VirtualBox. So any files that you create on one side show up on the other. <clears throat> this little plus on the right hand side, add new shared folder. We'll click there. For our folder path, we're going to click other and come in and pick something. I'm just going to pick documents and say, yeah, we'll just share that. Make sure you click auto mount and that you do not click read only because you want to be able to write files to this folder from inside of your virtual machine. And then we'll leave the mount point blank and it should pick a reasonable um, default. Okay, so that's one option. The other two I'll show you once we get inside of the virtual box. So. To start up our virtual box, all we have to do is select the virtual machine that we want and click start. This is going to boot up just like you were booting up your laptop or your desktop. It'll take it just a minute to get going. Could take two minutes. Like I said, my Windows machine quite slow. That's why I normally run Linux on it. Okay, starting up the virtual machine. See the splash screen. Our file system is clean, always a good sign. Exubuntu is the name of the operating system that we use inside the virtual machine. It's a very lightweight version of Linux because uh, some students just don't have that powerful of a machine. So we try to keep it as light as possible. I know, 4 gig, really? I don't know why it's so big. And we're up. Now, usually you can come in and select View Auto Size Guest Display. View Auto Size Guest Display, and it will automatically fit the desktop of your virtual machine into whatever size window you give it. That's not working on my Windows machine, but that's okay. That gives me the opportunity to show you how to fix that. Use the scroll bar on the right hand side to slide down so that you can see the start menu in the virtual machine. Click start, settings, display. Start settings display and you'll see we can change the resolution of the screen. Now my laptop just happens to have a 1280 by 768 display and so I'm going to select that as my resolution for my virtual machine. I'm going to use the entire screen for it in just a moment. We click apply, keep this configuration in our confirmation dialog, close, and now we almost fit within the window. It will fit if we go to full screen. And the way we do that is use the right control key and the F for full screen. That switches us then to the full screen mode. Now my entire display is being consumed by the virtual machine. When I want to get back to the host operating system, I use the right control key with F again, and now I'm back to my regular Windows environment. Now if you set up the shared folder, the question becomes where in the virtual machine is that shared folder? Well, there's two ways to find it. One is to open the file manager by clicking on the folder on your desktop and you will see that under devices there is an SF documents folder. That just happens to be shared with the documents folder under Windows. And so I can come in and create a new document. Plain text, we'll call it hello.txt. And there's my new file. Right control F to our file manager on Windows and there is the new hello.txt file 
in the documents folder on Windows. If our virtual machine dies, goes up in flames, then it doesn't really matter. We still got our files at least on the Windows side, the physical side. Now if you're in Bash, the desktop, then I'm control shift plus there to make it a little bit bigger for you. Then if we go to change directory slash media, this is where things mount. If we look here, we will see an SF underscore documents. And if we change to that directory, there is our documents folder from Windows, including the hello.txt file that we just created. Now, I did promise you other options. Second option is to use something like a thumb drive or a flash drive. If you plug it in, your Windows machine is going to recognize that it has been plugged in and is going to mount it to the Windows side. Here it's added it to the F drive. But we want to use it in our virtual machine. And so if we come up to the Devices menu and go to USB and select USB Disk 3.0, we hear a little bit of music while it unmounts from the Windows side. And then it magically appears over here on the Linux virtual machine size. If we look at USB Disk, then there is, in fact, our um, flash drive there and we can work from that if we so desire. Now you may be asking why is it not showing up under media? Because we mounted it as student rather than beforehand at, at the entire machine level. So if we look under student we will find then USB disk has been mounted there with a space in it. Whoever thinks of these things I can't imagine couple of other options for you. You can use Dropbox, for example. You can mount that file system virtually to your Windows side, and then when you save files there, they are automatically uploaded to Dropbox. Well, you can also mount them on the Linux side. I will leave it for you to figure out how to mount that into your virtual machine so that as you save files, they're automatically backed up to Dropbox or any other cloud server that you want. Another option, and the one that I recommend to my students, is to use a GitHub account, or maybe you would prefer GitLab or Bitbucket. I'm um, going to give you the 10,000 foot view of that. You'll need to go in to your account, create a free account, and create a repository, a private repository, to hold your homework. Make sure it's private so that you're not accused of cheating. And in that repository, once you've created it, you can go into code, and you can select the URL here that will create that uh, they would allow you to clone that. When you go back then into your virtual machine, you will be able to do a git clone, git clone, and the repository that you just copied. And uh, once you set up accounts, uh, got your password set up and such, it will then replicate that account into your local virtual machine. You can see that the data is there. The nice thing is you can also clone that same repository to Windows. I've got git installed on my Windows machine. In the command file you can see I've done the exact same command here, git clone my repository URL. And when I change into there you'll see exactly the same files. I can then push files to GitHub. I can pull files from GitHub, share between the two. It's kind of nice because it's not only putting uh, these files onto my host machine, but also on a cloud server, and that is going to keep them safe and secure, which makes me feel rather happy. So let me give you just a real quick walking tour through this new virtual environment, and then we will call it a video. So um, we've already seen a few things. You've seen Bash and Home there. Uh, as in Windows, uh, there is a Start button down here. You can um, click on the Start button. You can hit the Windows key on your keyboard. That will pop up. Uh, you can start typing, and it will then provide you with uh, files that match the text that you have typed in order to launch it. Um, you can come in. You'll see under Settings, there's the display that we've already looked at. Um, if you want to change the uh, background, you don't like this lovely background I picked for you, you can pick your own. I gave you several to choose from by collecting Settings Desktop. That's available right there. And um, another thing that you can do with this, uh, which you're probably not used to on Windows, if you hold down the Control and Alt keys, Control Alt right arrow, you will switch to what's called a new desktop. This allows you to do context switching. So I can uh, Control Alt left arrow and now I'm back in this context. I can come over here and be working on something that is 
totally different. You can switch between my two contexts or three or four, however many contexts you would like to have. Uh, also in the start menu we have our various uh, um, and accessories. We have text editor. This is the gedit text editor which is the one that I normally recommend for people new to gedit. Uh, where the directory I was in is no longer there, <laughs> so it's complaining. Um, very basic, uh, kind of a um, uh, Notepad++ kind of thing. Um, there are some other ones that you can have as well if you look under your uh, development directory. I didn't load Visual Studio Code for you if you want to use that, or Code Blocks, which I know is uh, you may have used in some earlier classes. We also have MELD, which is a visual differencing tool. If you have two versions of a file, you want to see what differences are, that will give you a really nice picture. DevHelp gives you documentation, particularly on GTKMM and some other technologies that you may cover in some of these classes as well. Okay. Um, if you're trying to launch a terminal, a quick way of doing that, Control-Alt-T. By the way, we'll just pop up a new terminal anytime you want one, which is pretty clear. One other thing that you have to remember, um, it's really tempting, particularly when we are in the windowed mode, to just close this uh, virtual box window and terminate it that way. That's the same thing from the operating system's perspective as if you ripped the battery out of your laptop. Does the operating system like that? No. No, it does not. So be kind to your virtual friends and come down to the lower right hand corner and what you will find here is a power button inside the virtual machine. Click this power button or if you prefer you can say start and that power button or if you want to be really sophisticated you can do a sudo shut down now. All three of those will terminate the machine with extreme prejudice. Okay, so I'll tell it go ahead do the shutdown. It doesn't take it very long to shut down. It's really quite quick. A couple of circles go around. It's disconnecting my thumb drive. And now we are back to the virtual box machine. It reconnects the uh, flash drive that we had connected into our virtual machine. And what you'll see here is our virtual machine is listed as powered off. Once we've powered off, life is good. You can close your virtual box manager and go on about your other classes that don't have all of this really cool technology in it. Okay, so that is how to install your virtual box in uh, import your appliance and get it set up so you don't lose your data by leaving it laying around on a virtual drive only and then how to shut down cleanly this new virtual machine. You have new knowledge. Have fun Go become a professional and go learn Linux.